Brought to you by PrayLatin.com, makers of prayer cards featuring complete English phonetic renderings of Latin pronunciations. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops held their meeting on who should and should not receive the Eucharist late last week. It was a real garbage heap of a meeting, with cheap moves played by certain high-profile cardinals to attempt to derail the key discussion. And rumors have swirled over the weekend about what was decided. Now, I'll refrain today from covering those rumors, and instead, we'll give you the cold, hard facts about what was discussed. Now, as usual, the bishops don't have the same courage of their convictions that the typical layperson does, as I'll show you in a moment. At least as a collective group, the bishops don't. But remember, we are supposed to pray for our bishops, so please try to remember to pray for these men if you can. They certainly could use that kind of support. Our blessed Lord said to pray even for our enemies, so you have no excuse not to pray for the bishops. Let's dive into this topic because it is a complicated one. That having been said, there were signs of hope. At the end of the meeting, the bishops, by an astonishing 75% margin, decided to approve a working draft of a document, Unworthy Reception of the Eucharist. Now again, this is a working document, and one that will be examined formally by their committee at their big meeting in November. Remember that, folks, because this is a full five months from now, and in that time, you'll get pressure from two principal groups. First, the Vatican, which already told them not to approve this document, and of course, from the men around Caesar himself, who will certainly use back-channel means of relaying the message about who really is in charge here, who pulls the purse strings. So pray for them, and pray that they maintain the sort of intestinal fortitude needed to carry on this important task. Now, That all having been said, tomorrow I'll go over what we know more fully. I'm still going over the statements and and all the other related news, and I want to make sure that we have a clear picture on the state of things. So today, let's go over context and the influence of the Holy See in all this, and I'm sure you're going to get some juicy sound bites from the bishops by the end of today that will reframe a lot of this, which is a point that I'll make again towards the end of this video. This story ain't over yet, folks, and the battle for the sanctity of the Eucharist has only just begun. Now let's begin with some context. What does does the typical regular mass-going Catholic believe on this topic? One source that focuses on all things anti-Moloch dove into this issue with some research data from a polling organization, and it's interesting. As usual, I have to play with the terminology used here to make it acceptable to the people who run this place, but the meaning will remain the same. Anyway, that news source, quote, The poll conducted by the CRC research polling firm for a Catholic anti-Moloch group, found 74% of Catholics who attend Mass regularly did not think pro-Moloch public Catholics should show up for communion, and another 83% of Catholics who regularly attend Mass say these figures create confusion and disunity because they do not follow these clear teachings of the Catholic Church. According to the survey, 87% of Catholics agree that the Church has a long-standing anti-Moloch position and has long taught that certain issues are of grave moral importance, such as this one. Another 83% say Catholic bishops should publicly defend all Catholic teachings, and 90% agree the bishops have an obligation to teach and lead others in matters of faith and morals. And mostly, quote, I think you get the idea, and the fact that many Catholics believe this is actually kind of astonishing. Of course, the key there is the part about them being regular mass attending Catholics. And by that, I will just assume that the uh, the firm here who collected this data means those who attend Mass every Sunday and on holy days of obligation. Now, it's almost as if regularly meeting your Sunday obligation and receiving our Lord in the most blessed sacrament of the altar really truly does help to align us with the will of our Lord and His Church. And it helps to clear your thinking on some of these types of topics. Go figure. I've always sort of assumed that the typical regular masculine Catholic was more sensible than the contrary position, but then again, often enough these days our faith is a label or a brand to some people, instead of the hard but beautiful truth that we live by. That's certainly evident from the online discourse surrounding whether or not the truly and extremely very devout Catholic that we're sort of obliquely talking about here should receive Holy Communion. 
And remember that statement about the majority of Catholics saying that public sinners should not receive the Eucharist without repentance and submitting to the teachings of the Church on this issue, because late last week the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops began their summer meeting on this very topic, and right out of the gate it got heated, with intense debate happening at the opening bell of the meeting before they had even gotten to the subject. I mean, it's kind of indicative of the state of the Catholic bishops and how seriously they take the Eucharist and the injunction of the Bible about receiving the body and blood of our Lord unworthily, when the National Catholic Register is having to run stories with headlines like this one. USCCB meeting. Debate erupts over allowing unlimited debate on proposal to draft document on Eucharist. The center of debate was whether there should be time limits on this topic. Their meeting is being held virtually because, well, of course it is. They can't even be bothered to meet in person like most of you do when you have work meetings these days. Now, the only thing I'm going to quote from this article is the following. Quote, Archbishop M Mitchell Rosansky of St. Louis introduced a motion that, at this meeting, we allow time for each bishop to speak on this important topic. This topic and its implications are so far-reaching that putting limits on the amount of time given for our discussion will not help us or our people as we discern which course should be taken. He cited the limitations of meeting over the Zoom platform and the fact that on this issue, the USCCB is looking for consensus. The proposal was met with considerable criticism, as it would inevitably have delayed a decision on drafting a document on the Eucharist. Archbishop Joseph Kurtz of Louisville, Kentucky, who served as USCCB head from 2013 to 2016, called the idea a painful delay. And Archbishop Joseph Nauman of Kansas City, Kansas, head of the U.S. Bishops' anti moloch Committee, said that the motion was a delaying tactic that will make it impossible to get this document decided upon in a timely manner. Note that Archbishop Brzezanski wants consensus on the document. I mean, good luck with that, since there are some bishops who have a Catholic sense about this issue, and others who, if they spoke openly about how they really feel, would get the Church to submit to the world on this teaching of the Church like everything else. Make no mistake about that. And this issue is made all the more confusing for some Catholics who don't understand Francis' thinking by the fact that last week Francis intervened and told the bishops not to deny the person in question Holy Communion, despite working tirelessly against the Church's moral authority. And then Francis, right afterwards, turned around and refused the, to permit that person in question from attending the Papal Mass, thus denying him Holy Communion. I'd be confused by this, but I learned all about Francis' way of thinking about these kinds of things by reading Austin Ivray's book, The Great Reformer. The book is penned by someone who adores Francis and wants to do everything in his power to make him look good, but he accidentally let the truth about Francis' formative years slip into that book to the point that the second edition and onwards of that book focuses a lot less on his formative years in Argentina. So while I always call Austin Ivory a professional Fra Francis fan fiction writer, the first edition of The Great Reformer is a must-have if you want to understand what is going on in the church since the arrival of Francis on the Sea of Peter. Not that I'm suggesting that the, the present state of things in the church is really the product of Francis' papacy. It's not. He is actually sort of the fruit of the state of the church. He is not the um, sole cause of it. And then the point I'm making is this. Francis has a long history of playing both sides of an issue, moving the issue more and more in favor of the innovators and the modernists, while also throwing a bone to the more traditional or at least Catholic side of the argument. That is the case here with the denial of the public mass for Caesar's visit to the Pope this past week, which serves as a strange backdrop to all of this. The meeting of the bishops, though, began on Wednesday, and I expect we'll hear what they have to say about this topic by the end of the day, mostly through rumors, probably by the end of the day, today, Monday. And when they do, I'll have as much of their document as is reasonable for your listening displeasure, or at least the rumored document, since I'm sure some will leak. Although I don't expect much to come from the meeting one way or the other, but maybe we'll all be surprised. But the core of this issue is the concept of Eucharistic coherence, which I touched upon recently, but I'll define again for you here. Robert Royal, writing over at the Catholic thing, summarizes this whole mess in this way, quote, The term Eucharistic coherence was first used in 2007's document issued by the Latin American bishops at Aparecida, Brazil. The chair of the drafting committee, Jorge Bergoglio, then Cardinal Archbishop of Buenos Aires, now Pope Francis. The Aparecida document says clearly and forcefully, we must adhere to Eucharistic coherence. That is, be conscious that they, Catholics in the public life who serve Moloch, cannot receive Holy Communion and at the same time act with deeds or words against the commandments, particularly when sacrifices to Moloch and other grave actions are encouraged. This responsibility weighs particularly over Catholic decision-makers in the secular realm. 
What answer will our bishops give to this very question? Ironically, certain members of the American Episcopate, Cardinal Supich and Tobin notably, who have not been chosen by their fellow bishops to positions of authority, have gone to Rome to try to block the American bishops from saying precisely what Cardinal Bergoglio and the Latin American Bishops Conference said. End quote. That's the funny thing about this. Back in 2007, Cardinal Jorge Bergoglio defended the church's position on this topic in writing, and he has said, since then, some rather spicy things that none of us would disagree with on that topic. But now in 2021, the same man has his Roman Curia attempt to intervene on behalf of all the self-described Catholics who are high-profile figures who push the Moloch program and ignore what the church says on this and pretty much every topic, really, where the church is at odds with the world. We are, after all, talking about the man who I call Caesar, who witnessed and served as the chief minister of a James Martin-style nuptial moment that was a mockery of that holy sacrament. His actions on that and the various Moloch topics have earned him an automatic excommunication, not that anyone's going to enforce it, aside from not permitting him to attend Mass with the Pope, who honestly was probably just a move to appease people like us anyway. Robert Royal is a Vatican reporter with a long track record of covering the U.S. bishops and other church topics. You may have heard rumors about what was said at those meetings over the weekend, and, you know, I'll go over them in the coming days if necessary, but as Mr. Royal says, we won't hear anything until the formal document is released in November at the annual Bishop's Shindig. Quote, Those who were in authority at the Bishop's Conference decided, through regular procedures, to look into this question again. It's remarkable that strong debates have already erupted over the mere fact that this meeting will discuss the communion question. Any statement, if one does appear, will be issued only after a second round of discussion and voting at the bishop's annual meeting in November. End quote. In other words, they won't make a real decision until November. And then who knows what the state of things will be like. Given how things have been the last couple of years, they may not even be able to have a meeting at all at that time. So don't hold your breath on them making any courageous decisions quite yet. These are the U.S. bishops we're talking about, after all, and part of what is required to become a bishop of the church in America is a strong lack of a spine. If you want to read my sources for this episode for yourself, which I encourage you to do, you'll find them linked in today's show notes at returntotradition.org. That's the name of this podcast or channel with a .org at the end. Skip past the Patreon pop-up if you want to see the post, unless you want to, you know, become a patron of the channel, since there's no paywall for my sources. But the key takeaway is this. At the start of the meeting, there were attempts to make the issue unresolvable. What that means in the most plain English possible is that there were attempts to prevent the bishops from being able to act to defend the integrity of the Blessed Sacrament by using cheap tricks of the rule book to prevent the issue from being decided upon formally by the bishops by opening the door to grandstanding of all kinds, at least at this stage of things. Now, were they successful? Probably not. I'm sure we'll hear rumors about how the supages and Tobins and the rest all tried to use more cheap tricks to stop the discussion. How this plays out remains to be seen, since at this point it's Monday and we're just dealing with rumors here. But I intend to be here providing all the coverage you need for that meeting in November. So hit the subscribe button if you haven't done so yet so you don't miss anything. Now what do you think of this? Now, am I being too hard on the U.S. bishops when I say that most of them lack a spine? Do you think they'll act in any way that isn't merely symbolic? Let me know your thoughts in the comments, please, and try to keep it civil if you can. Remember that we're supposed to be Christians and that we should all act like it, even online, while still defending the truth and the deposit of the faith. But I'd love to see what you have to say, so let me know, and please, as always, pray for the church. Thanks for listening. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.